Good morning. Good morning. Glad to see you all as we prepare to worship our Lord and Savior this morning. I'm going to invite you to get out the In the Life of the Church insert in your bulletin while you were doing that. Good morning to you who are joining us online. We are really glad that you're spending your Sunday morning with us here at Madeira Silverwood. Okay, just a few things to um, point out to you. Uh, first, newsletters are available, so if you have not done so yet, pick up your August newsletter. They're in the entry foyer. That will help save us a couple of pennies on, on stamps, and that would be very, very helpful. And then um, a couple of other things that are happening this week. Our Munch Bunch is going to be ha having its annual, or monthly, not annual, our, its monthly gathering at Deshays on Thursday at 1130 Donna Higdon would love to talk to you about that, so you can touch base with her. Uh, also, our Honduras mission team is back, and we are going to be doing a dinner, a light dinner, I think subs, chips, salad, that kind of thing, uh, on Saturday at 5 o'clock. This is a great opportunity to hear some of the stories about the good work that God did uh, in Honduras. It's also, uh, we're going to have our mission partners from Master Provisions who are going to be with us. And so it's going to help us kind of connect the dots of things that we've been supporting through Master Provisions and the trip that we took. Uh, we'll have some slides and, and stories. So I do hope you will come, come and, and be inspired. I think it's going to be a very spiritually nourishing experience. Then next Sunday, next Sunday is our backpack blessing. This is a new a tradition that Missy Hardy instituted with us last year. And so uh, you know, school year is getting ready to start back up. And not just for students and teachers, but administrators, bus drivers, uh, counselors, all kinds of people that work in schooling. And so we're going to be praying for you and blessing you if you are in that mix. We're going to be doing it in both services, and um, so we do invite you all to come and be a part of that, whatever your role in the school is. And then Missy has a little um, token that uh, everyone will be able to take with them just as a reminder of the prayer of blessing that was uh, prayed over you in that service. So I do hope that you can be a part of that as well. Finally, on just a kind of a a family note here for the congregation. We did have two of our uh, members of our f church family that have passed away recently. One, Ralph Hefner, um, the father of Keith Hefner, father-in-law of Catherine Hefner, he passed away. Uh, his visitation was yesterday. The funeral service will be on Tuesday at Gate of Heaven Cemetery. And then also Kenny Lowe passed away. And Kenny's you know, been with us for, you know, a big part of our congregation as well. Uh, we're going to be having a service for him on Friday at 6 o'clock, and um, I do hope that you can come and participate that as well. And uh, please be keeping both the Hefner family and the Lowe family in your prayers in the days ahead. Okay, my friends, we're here to worship. We're here to turn to our living Lord and Savior. We're here to... Uh, to seek his power, his strength, his comfort, all our living and all our dying is lift out before him. And he is our strength and our shield. And so I'm going to invite you to prepare your hearts. Prepare your hearts to meet with the Lord with this opening hymn, hymn number 82, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. Brothers and sisters, as you are able, let's stand, let's join our voices together on hymn number 82.
be seated. As we come in worship, uh, we are in a season where we are focusing deeply on the Lord's Prayer. And, uh, and for those of you who were with us last week and we did a more contemporary version of the Lord's Prayer, have no fear. This is the traditional service. We'll be doing the traditional rendition of the Lord's Prayer. So what you learned as a child, we're going to keep doing um, for, you know, in, in, in this service. But uh, part of what I'm going to invite you to do uh, as, uh, as our invocation, we're going to observe a few moments of silence. Because you will remember that what I asked you to do through the week is to be continually praying the Lord's Prayer. And so I'm just going to ask you, in these few moments of silence that we're going to observe, be bringing the, you know, your heart to the Lord through the instrument, through the words of the Lord's Prayer. We're going to be talking about that all throughout this series, but I'm just going to invite you to practice it in some silence right now, and then I will lead us in a corporate recitation of the Lord's Prayer. So let us go before the throne of grace and, and offer our silent prayers. Silence, Father God, here in the silence of this place, we do bring the prayers of our hearts to you. And we know because you are a good and gracious Father, we can call out to you using the prayer that Christ taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. And as we have gone before the throne of grace, we also remember our deep need of grace, the need of God's power and presence in our lives. This corporate prayer of confession helps us be mindful of that. And so, brothers and sisters, will you join your hearts and your voices with mine on our printed corporate prayer of confession? Let us pray. Merciful God, we confess that we remain preoccupied with ourselves, separated from brothers and sisters in Christ. We cling to destructive habits hold grudges, show reluctance to welcome one another, and we allow the past to hold us hostage. Have mercy upon us, O Lord. Heal and forgive us. Bring us peace, calm our fears, and free us for joyful obedience so that we may serve you in the world as agents of your reconciling love through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, hear these words of assurance that come from the scripture we're going to be taking a look at a little bit later today, but nestled right in the heart of Psalm 103. This powerful reminder that the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth. So great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. So 
of brothers and sisters, through the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ, all your sins are forgiven. And what's more, you are called beloved children. And God looks upon you and says, you are my beloved daughter. You are my beloved son. You are my beloved child. This is the good news. Thanks be to God. come to the time of the service where we receive God's tithes and our offerings. And today, I, you know, I, I always invite you to be mindful of, you know, how you are sent as God's people. Today, I want you to be mindful just of the blessings you have received, the favor and the goodness and the blessings that you have received from God the Father. And just wallow in that and bask in that as we enjoy this offering uh, this offertory offered for the glory of God.
Let us pray. Lord, we rejoice in your goodness, in your grace, in your kindness, and your mercy. We rejoice in the favor that you extend to us as your beloved children. We return these tithes and offerings unto you out of gratitude and out of joy in being your children. We pray that you are pleased with these offerings, and we pray, pray that you would give us more opportunities to offer of ourselves so that we may show your goodness to the world. So into your hands we commit these tithes and these offerings, and we commit our very selves, all for your great honor and glory. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. And let us continue our worship as the deacons are taking the offering back. Let us continue our worship by joining our voices together on hymn number 372, I Then Shall Live. scripture reading this morning is Psalm 103. Hear now the word of the Lord. Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion who satisfies your desires with good things so that your, your youth is renewed like the eagles. The, the Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. 
He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. The life of the mortals is like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it, and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him, his righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works, everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, my soul. This is the word of the Lord. And may God add his blessing to the reading and to the proclamation of his word. Amen. So for those of you who are just joining us this week, who weren't with us last week, we kicked off a new series last week, How to Talk with God. We're going to be spending time working through the Lord's Prayer, uh, but not in, you know, the Lord's Prayer in the sense of just going through the rote motions, but how do we work with the Lord's Prayer all throughout our day as a way of bringing our inner world, our inner experience to connect with the living God? And uh, for those of you who were with us last week, I got a question for you because I, I challenged you, and your challenge, your task all through this series is going to be practicing the Lord's Prayer all throughout your week. You know, practicing the Lord's Prayer, using the words of the Lord's Prayer to connect with God. So when you have those moments of downtime, letting your mind go back to the Lord's Prayer, you're stuck in traffic. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You're waiting in line at the grocery store. Thy kingdom come will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You're waiting on today's coffee. Give us this day our daily bread. <laughs> and so on and so forth. And whatever the inner experience is, when, you know, whether you're sad, depressed, lonely, anxious, bringing that to the Lord, using the Lord's prayer as your springboard, or perhaps you're joyful, excited, feeling expansive or grateful, bringing that to the Lord, using the Lord's Prayer as a springboard. I want you to be doing that all throughout your day, practicing the Lord's Prayer throughout your day. That was my challenge to you last week. That's the challenge all through this week. So my first question is, how you doing? Have you been practicing it? And I'm going to lean into you on this one. I really want you to practice the Lord's Prayer as we go through this series. If, if you don't make at least a, a, a good effort try, then you know, this is not going to be very terribly helpful for you at all. It's just not going to be, you know, it's going to be an interesting intellectual exercise, but it's not going to be very helpful or transformative. So I, I ask you, as a brother and as a friend, lean into this and, and make a good faith effort throughout your days of the week to practice working with the Lord's Prayer as a way of bringing your inner world to connect with God. Now, as we go through this, 
I'm not promising you I'm going to give you the definitive theological explanation of all the phrases of the Lord's Prayer. Each week we're going to take a different phrase of the Lord's Prayer. Um, you know, that's all interesting and well and good. What I want to do is talk about the experience of praying the Lord's Prayer on a continual basis and some of the things that I have learned and experienced. Uh, this is not the definitive. As you work through, work with the Lord's Prayer, you might experience something else. You might experience some other way of you know, using a particular phrase from the Lord's Prayer as a springboard for connecting with God. That's fine. The important thing is practicing it. Practicing it to connect with the living God. So this week, we're going to focus on our Father who art in heaven, or our Father who is in heaven. You know, the archaic who art is, you know, is an archaic way of saying, who exists in heaven, our Father in heaven. And, 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 and this is such a magnificent phrase. What a wonderful gift we have through the grace of Jesus Christ, through his redeeming and saving work. We have the gift of being able to call God Father. You know, other ancient pagan religions, they got, the gods were distant. They were off on Mount Olympus. They were off in Valhalla, no, not Valhalla, but, you know, off, you know, in Asgard or other, other places. And occasionally they would come down and, and visit earth and occasionally they would have favorites, uh, but, but they treated their favorites kind of like the way we treat puppies, you know, and, 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 and you know, they don't ha really have the deep personal person-to-person -person relationship. And, and you know, I think the great contrast, you go and read the two great works of Western uh, literature, the Iliad and the Odyssey, and you see how the, the ancient gods interacted with humans, and humans are playthings. And, and not only are they playthings, but their life was brutal, nasty, and short. How different it is that Jesus gives us this capacity to call God Father, to know that we are beloved children, that we are cherished. And I realized some of us had great fathers. Some of us had great parents who conveyed to us a sense of being cherished, being loved, being cared for, being challenged to fulfill our potential and all that. Other, others of us, not so much. Many of us had abusive, neglectful, or even absent Fathers. And so, you know, I, I, I understand that for some people, this, this phrase, our father, actually becomes a barrier because of their experience with their earthly father. Um, and, and, and this is where I'm, I'm asking us maybe to flip the script a little bit. You know, instead of using our earthly parents as a paradigm to understand God, which is our natural tendency, that's kind of where we start with all this stuff. But Jesus, I suggest, is inviting us to understand our infinite, eternal, immortal creator God defines what it is. Defines what it is to be a good father, to be a good parent. Just as God, who created the universe, created the laws of physics, the laws of biology, all the laws of science, the laws of psychology, the laws of relationships, the moral and ethical structure of the universe, so in the same way does the God who created all things define what the good father means. And, and our earthly fathers, our earthly parents, only partake of that in frail ways. So let God define for you everything you would have yearned for or longed for, everything you wished you would have, all the encouragement, all the nurturing, all the cherishing, all the love, all the challenge, all the seeing the potential and the opportunity, everything that we would hope and yearn for from our earthly parents, God fills that and more because God defines what that role is. And Jesus says we get to call upon God as this intimate, caring, loving, perfect Father who cares for us and longs and delights in our becoming the fullness of what we were created to be. Your heavenly Father 
knows your truest self, and he tells you what your truest self is. If you get nothing else out of this, get that today. Your heavenly father knows your truest self. He defines your truest self. He cherishes your truest self, and he tells you and helps you grow into what your truest self is and will be. Any number of people will try to tell you what your truest self is. Don't let some religious guru, don't let me. You know, the, your family, your friends, a lot of people will try to tell you who you are. But God alone knows your full identity. Other people may be instruments in discovering that, but God alone knows the fullness of who you are and who you were created to be. And he declares it good. And through the grace of Jesus Christ, you can participate in that because through the grace of Jesus Christ, you can call God Father and trust God as Father. And so, um, with that thought in mind, as we work with this idea of our Father who is in heaven, I chose Psalm 103 um, because I think Psalm 103 captures a number of elements about the fatherhood of God and praying our Father who art in heaven that have been very powerful and helpful for me. So we'll dig right in. First thing I want you to know is take a look at the first two verses. Praise the Lord my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord my soul and forget not his benefits. So there, I love how this psalm begins and ends with praise. Did you notice that? The first two verses are praise, and then the last couple of verses, praise, and it begins, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. You know, and so I love how David just kind of orchestrates that. That's a nice literary piece. But here at the beginning, he's talking about an inward praise. Praise my soul, praise all my inmost being. It's this inner connection. And that's why I keep talking about your inner world. You know, your, your secret thoughts, your secret desires, your secret, you know, all those things that you may not necessarily share with anybody else, but God knows and God sees and God experiences that. And it's connecting with God in that inner world as a relationship of delight and praise and joy and wonder. It's this heartfelt connection with God, not God as some distant thing. As, as my, my usual turn of phrase, you've heard me say it a zillion times, not God as some aged English actor on top of an iceberg. Oh, yes, I am God, you shall be smited. No, <laughs> it's not that. It's an intimate, personal God who loves you. And you can engage in loving conversation with, with God. Um, you know, the, the key piece, I think, to this would be verse 13. You hop on down to verse 13. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Connecting with God in this heartfelt, personal sense. Not simply intellectually, but in a heartfelt way. I think the, the, the theologian J.I. Packer captures this very nicely in his, his wonderful book, Knowing God, it's a bit dry, but it's a very readable dry. It's not incomprehensible dry, um, but it is chock full of wonderful insights. And he says this, uh, if you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, find out how much he makes of the thought of being God's child and having God as his father. If this is not the thought that prompts and controls his worship and prayer and his whole outlook on life, it means he does not understand Christianity very well at all. This understanding of the fatherhood of God controlling our worship. And we don't just show up and worship because that's what you're supposed to do. Well, maybe we do, but that's not what we're designed <laughs> to do. You don't just show up and worship so you can see your friends. You show up and worship to spend time with the Father, with his people together. You have individual time with God and you have corporate time with God. It's all spending time with the Father. You know, another angle on this that I find, you know, this personal aspect, this heartfelt connection that we talk about. You know, another angle would be from uh, Reggie Kidd. Reggie was one of my seminary professors. He taught worship and the Pauline epistles. He wrote a wonderful little book called With One Voice. It was, this is highly readable. Um, and it's mostly about worship 
but he talks about how uh, when he was in college, this would have been back in the 1970s, so when he was in college, he was driving in the back roads of Virginia, and, you know, and he was in the middle of nowhere, and his car broke down in the middle of the night, in the middle of nowhere, in the backwoods of Virginia. And he was feeling a little scared. You know, I mean, where does your mind go? You immediately start thinking of deliverance. Dun, 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 um, you know, and that's kind of scary. And Reggie didn't know what to do. He wasn't a mechanic. He didn't know how to fix the car. And so the, he did what he did know how to do. He got in the back seat of his car, pulled out his guitar, and he started playing songs of praise. And, you know, he was in a particular phase where he was learning a lot of the psalms on guitar. And so this psalm, Psalm 103, was one. 103.13, as the father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. He also latched on to Psalm 139. Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? And he just starts singing these songs of praise into the night. And this is what he says. Listen to this quote. In the midst of the woods, sung out into what Simon and Garfunkel had mistakenly called darkness, my old friend, God showed up. And I knew for myself what David meant when he praised God as the one who was enthroned on the praises of Israel. That, my friends, is what I'm talking about when I talk about experiencing God as Father. When you are alone on a dusty, on a backwoods road in the middle of the dark and you're scared and you cry out, our Father who art in heaven, and God shows up and brings comfort. And that's where this phrase helps me. You ever have those moments in your day where you just feel like nobody sees you? Nobody cares? You know, you, it's funny. You, 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 think, you think you get over that in high school. We're going back to school. You're thinking about school stuff. You think you, you get over that in high school. In high school, it's like everybody's anxious. You know, is anybody paying attention to me? Everybody's watching, and nobody really knows me, and we don't know. And you know, the thing is, teenagers just talk about that, and they deal with it. But it doesn't go away when you become an adult, right? I mean, let's be real. You start off your career, and you're constantly you know, trying to get the attention of people so that you can advance. You hit midlife. You know what the midlife crisis is? When you look around and you realize, I've been investing all this time and all this energy into this organization, and in 20 years, everything I have done will be completely obsolete. 15 years after I retire, nobody will remember my name. What's this all for? And those of us who are a little more seasoned in, in life, you, you uh, are you know, perhaps a little further on. I talk to a number of older folks that just feel invisible in this world that seems to be built for youth. It seems like nobody pays attention, nobody cares. You ever feel invisible? You ever feel neglected by even by those people you love the most? That is where the prayer, our Father, comes in. So helpful. Crying out, our Father, our Father who sees, our Father who knows you, our Father who nothing escapes his attention. You may feel neglected by the rest of the world, but you are known. You may feel ignored, but you are attended to. Because your Father loves you and cherishes you. This is what I mean by bringing our feelings in. We can sit there and wallow in that stuff. I mean, feelings are feelings. They just happen. We can sit there and wallow in that stuff. But we're invited to, by Christ, to bring it to God in prayer. Daddy, our Father. And God shows up, just like he did for Reggie on that backwoods road in Virginia. God shows up and does something. 
Now, I skipped from verse 2 to verse 13 because that verse 13, well worth memorizing, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. If you brought your own Bible, you probably want to underline that and put a circle by it. But, but uh, I skipped over verses 3 through 12. 3 through 12, he talks about all these benefits. I, I'm kind of glossing over all those because if you take a closer look at those, it's pretty much where we're going with the rest of the Lord's Prayer. I mean, you've got forgiveness in there. You've got uh, making known his ways to Moses. We'll, we'll dig into stuff uh, like that when we talk about thy kingdom come. I'll explain that later. You know, there's, there's thy will be done. There's, you know, the, there's, there's all the other stuff of the Lord's Prayer that's kind of packed into those promises. They are good and great promises, well worth lingering on. Um, but we'll save that for another time in Psalm 103. The big thing I want you to get is that all these things find their root and their fullness in first understanding God as Father. When you understand God as the loving, cherishing Father, all the other stuff about forgiveness and uh, thy kingdom come and you know, give us this day our daily bread, all that other stuff kind of falls into place. If you have a hard time grasping God as Father, you do wind up having a hard time with all that other stuff, and that is why it's so important to understand this is what grace is through the work of Jesus Christ, through his dying, rising, and ascending on high. You are children of God, and nothing will shake you out of God's hands. Everything else flows from that. Now, we move past verse 13, and there's a couple of other things here that I found helpful. Uh, verses 14 through 16 point us to our immortality, for he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. The life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like the flower of a field. The wind blows over it and is gone in its place and remembers it no more. You know, not only does God help us when we feel neglected, isolated, alone, scared, also helps us face our mortality. I mean, that's kind of what's going on there in those verses. Yeah, I'm sure you all deal with that yourselves. You know, the knees don't work as well as once they did. <laughs> you know, the, the, the hips just don't work as well as once they did. Parts that didn't sag now sag. <laughs> There are, you know, there are wrinkles where once there were none. The forehead suddenly gets a lot bigger than once it was before. And the mind doesn't recall the facts as readily as once it did. Sometimes you find yourself grasping. You start to feel your capacities slip like sand through your fingers, and it can be sobering. It can be very sobering. And so this passage reminds us our Father knows. Our Father knows that we have those existential crises of facing our own mortality. But then it goes on. Take a look at verse 17. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him. Yes, we are mortal, but God is infinite, eternal, and immortal. Yes, we live in space and time. God created space and time. We have eternal life in our relationship with him. Our Father loves us so much that nothing in our life will be lost because we live in him. The Lord's love is with those who fear him, fear, reverent relationship. It's not, to, oh, remember, it's that reverent covenantal relationship of reverence and awe and fidelity to one another. So who are in relationship with, with him and his righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. And because God's throne is established and rules over all things, you are completely secure. When Christ died, rose, and ascended on high, what did he say in John 14? I go to prepare a place for you. You have a place in eternity. Already, even now, it is prepared for you. 
And that truth and that reality can then define our living today so that we are not even crushed by frailty and death. So those times when you're very human frail, when my very human frailty, when I'm facing that in the quiet hours of the morning or waiting in the doctor's <laughs> waiting room, our Father, who art in heaven, brings me great comfort and great strength and great encouragement. And then you see where this ends. Verse 20, praise the Lord, you angels, you mighty one who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion. Does that not sound like for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen? Indeed, it does. And you see how it bookends. It goes from this very personal prayer to the cosmic, or personal praise to the very cosmic, thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. And there you are in the midst of it. The last word, praise the Lord, my soul. Because of the fatherhood of God, you have the place in the eternal chorus of praise. So, I invite you, brothers and sisters, to think on these things, but not just to think on these things. Practice them in the quiet hours, in the quiet moments. Whatever, you know, as you practice the Lord's Prayer, whatever it is that you're experiencing, look to the fatherhood of God. Does that truth speak into your life? in those quiet moments, in certain ways? How do you pray the fatherhood of God back to God so that he will show up in your life? Practice it. And I eagerly await the stories you'll have to tell me about how God has shown up in your life this week as you practice praying the Lord's Prayer. You think about that and you practice it. Amen. Now we come to the time of the service when we observe the Lord's Supper. And the Lord's Supper is interesting. One thing I kind of glossed over in this passage as it talked about the benefits. There were some very personal benefits. Um, you know, redeems your life from the pit, crowns you with love and compassion. But then there is also corporate benefits. Look at verse 7. He made known his way to Moses and his deeds to the people of Israel. That God is your father. God is also the father of his people. And all that comes together in the Lord's Supper. Here in the Lord's Supper, we have the elements. You receive them individually, and yet we receive them together corporately. It's an act we do together. We don't understand the Lord's Supper to be a private act. It's an act of the church. And it's an act that ties and unites us to Christians all over the world across space and time. It is a personal act, and it is a corporate act. And so as we come today to receive the Lord's Supper, I'm going to invite you to remember Remember the very personal nature of God as your Father through the grace of Jesus Christ. But also remember that God has brought you into a family. God is our Father as well. I'm going to invite you to think on those things as we receive the Lord's Supper. Um, I'm going to invite you to stand and let us begin our observation of the Lord's Supper by reciting once again the Apostles' Creed, which is a wonderful summary of the things that we believe as Christians. Christians, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified dead and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. 
From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated, and the elders who are serving may come forward. Brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, on the night that he was betrayed, our Lord took bread, and breaking it, he said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In like manner, after supper, he took the cup, and pouring it, he said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for the remission of sins. Drink of it, all of you. For whenever you drink this bread, or drink this cup and eat this bread, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so, brothers and sisters, the table has been set. The feast has been prepared. As the elders bring the elements of the Lord's Supper to you, you will notice we have a plate of bread, and we have the trays of juice. If, however, you need a gluten-free option, there is a cracker in the bottom of the juice cup for you to receive. And now, brothers and sisters, receive the grace and the favor of Jesus Christ as it comes to you. Let us receive the Lord's Supper.
brothers and sisters, the body and the blood of Christ given for you. And now, brothers and sisters, go in grace, go in mercy, go in peace. May the living Lord Jesus Christ go with you. May he go above you to watch over you, behind you to encourage you, beside you to befriend you, within you to give you peace, and before you to show you the way, both now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>